Thank you. Thank you very much. Chancellor Cole, Governing Mayor Deepkin, ladies and gentlemen, 24 years ago, President John F. Kennedy visited Berlin. And speaking to the people of this city and the world at the City Hall, well, since then, two other presidents have come, each in his turn to Berlin. And today, I myself make my second visit to your city. We come to Berlin, we American presidents, because it's our duty to speak in this place of freedom. But I must confess, we're drawn here by other things as well, by the feeling of history in this city, more than 500 years older than our own nation, by the beauty of the Grunwald and the Tiergarten, most of all, by your courage and determination. Perhaps the composer Paul Linke understood something about American presidents. You see, like so many presidents before me, I come here today because wherever I go, whatever I do, ich hab na keinen Koffer in Berlin. Our gathering today is being broadcast throughout Western Europe and North America. I understand that it is being seen and heard as well in the East. To those listening throughout Eastern Europe, I extend my warmest greetings and the goodwill of the American people. To those listening in East Berlin, a special word. Although I cannot be with you, I address my remarks to you just as surely as to those standing here before me. For I join you as I join your fellow countrymen in the West in this firm, this unalterable belief, as gibbet nor ein Berlin. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic south, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wire, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Farther south, there may be no visible, no obvious wall, but there remain armed guards and checkpoints all the same. Still a restriction on the right to travel. Still an instrument to impose upon ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state. Yet it is here in Berlin where the wall emerges most clearly. Here, cutting across your city, where the news photo and the television screen have imprinted this brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner forced to look upon a scar. President von Weizsäcker has said the German question is open as long as the Brandenburg Gate is closed. But today, today I say as long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open but the question of freedom for all mankind. <laughs> Yet, I do not come here to lament, for I find in Berlin a message of hope, even in the shadow of this wall, a message of triumph. 
In this season of spring in 1945, the people of Berlin emerged from their air raid shelters to find devastation. Thousands of miles away, the people of the United States reached out to help. And in 1947, Secretary of State, as you've been told, George Marshall, announced the creation of what would become known as the Marshall Plan. Speaking precisely 40 years ago this month, he said, our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. In the Reichstag a few moments ago, I saw a display commemorating this 40th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. I was struck by a sign, a sign on a burnt out gutted structure that was being rebuilt. I understand that Berliners of my own generation can remember seeing signs like it dotted throughout the western sectors of the city. The sign read simply, the Marshall Plan is helping here to strengthen the free world. A strong free world in the West, that dream became real. Japan rose from ruin to become an economic giant. Italy, France, Belgium, virtually every nation in Western Europe saw political and economic rebirth. The European community was founded. In West Germany and here in Berlin, there took place an economic miracle. The Wirtschaftswandir. Adenauer, Erhardt, Reuter, and other leaders understood the practical importance of liberty, that just as truth can flourish only when the journalist is given freedom of speech, so prosperity can come about only when the farmer and businessman enjoy economic freedom. The German leaders the German leaders reduced tariffs, expanded free trade, lowered taxes. From 1950 to 1960 alone, the standard of living in West Germany and Berlin doubled. Where four decades ago there was rubble, today in West Berlin there is the greatest industrial output of any city in Germany. Busy office blocks, fine homes and apartments, proud avenues and the spreading lawns of parkland. Where a city's culture seemed to have been destroyed, today there are two great universities, orchestras and an opera, countless theaters and museums. Where there was want, today there's abundance, food, clothing, automobiles, the wonderful goods of the Kudam. From devastation, from utter ruin, you Berliners have in freedom rebuilt a city that once again ranks as one of the greatest on earth. And the Soviets may have had other plans, but my friends, there were a few things the Soviets didn't count on. Berliner Herz, Berliner Humor, Ja und Berliner Schnauzer. In the 1950s, in the 1950s, Khrushchev predicted, we will bury you. But in the West today, we see a free world that has achieved a level of prosperity and well-being unprecedented in all human history.